Have you ever answered the phone when it rings? And the first thing you hear on the other end is something to the effect of, Quem está falando? <laughs> you pick it up and they say, Who's talking? Who is this? Um, you know, in our home, when I was a child, we were always taught that in proper phone etiquette, if you make a phone call, that when it's answered, you always self-identify first. Uh, you don't just say, can I talk to so-and-so? Uh, or, who is this? You say, hi, this is Nathaniel Fawcett. Could I please speak to Joel Rast or whoever else it may be? Um, but there's something important about self-identification. Not only on the phone, but also, as, as we might tie this into our spiritual eyes, even more importantly. Um, Speaking of the phone, though, here at church, our dear, beloved minister of administration, Douglas, if you call his hamal here at church and he knows who's calling, uh, you never know who might answer. Sometimes it's the funeral home. Sometimes it's the, the pizza place around the corner. Um, sometimes it's just someone who says, Kiktoke. What do you want? Is what it means. That's not only for Hakel Anderson. That's for me, too. But here's the question. Self-identification. How do you self-identify? How do you identify yourself? Because this question of self-identification flows through the next account that we arrive at in the Gospel of Mark. And in this passage, we're going to see the two primary themes of this Gospel collide. The theme of the messianic secret, where Christ has intentionally not broadcast his identity as the Messiah out of a desire to not raise false hopes and false expectations among the general populace. Those who are expecting their Messiah to be a military commander, a military leader, an earthly king who's going to set Israel free from the oppression of the Roman Empire... He wanted people to know more about the kind of Messiah he would be before identifying himself broadly and publicly as the Messiah. The second theme that collides here is the theme of discipleship failure. Now, my dear beloved friends, we have been in the Gospel of Mark for two years now. And if you have not yet figured out that discipleship failure is one of his primary themes... I don't know where I'm going with that. I don't know what else there is to say. If you haven't figured that out yet, there's a problem. Because ultimately, discipleship failure has everything to do with how we, potential disciples of Christ, self-identify. Specifically, as it relates to the identity of Christ himself as Messiah and as God. So we'll continue the reading in Mark today in chapter 14. Picking up the account in verse 53, if you recall, our most recent occurrence is Christ being arrested and subsequently being abandoned by all his disciples. All of them ran off into the dark night, even after Peter had made such great vows that he would never fall away, even if everyone else would, he would never fall away. And Christ looks at him in the eye and says, Peter, yes, you will. And you will not only run away, but you will specifically deny me. And Peter very belligerently denies that he will deny. But we'll see where that actually takes us and where that took him. And that account ends with this shameful image of a young man so terrified that when he was grabbed by one of these soldiers, one of the arresting force, he was wearing a single garment and he left that garment in the man's hand and ran away into the night naked. And there's significant historical evidence to suggest that that young man was Mark himself, the author of this gospel. So that theme of discipleship failure, the disciple or the potential disciple fleeing naked in the middle of the night in terror and fear because of what was happening to Jesus. And now we pick up the story in verse 53. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, elders and teachers of the law came together. 
Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this man-made temple and in three days will build another not made by man. Even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What's this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You've heard this blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. Now, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you, you are one of them, for you're a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Why are we treating these two accounts together? It's because they're occurring simultaneously. Think about that for a moment. Mark actually gives us this brief statement about Peter in verse 54 as an anchor. Peter was following at a distance. He gives us that as an anchor, just as a little reminder to say, listen, everything that's going to happen to Jesus now, what I'm going to relate to you that Peter did, that's happening at the same time. Christ's trial is concurrent with Peter's denial. And the experience of both of these individuals, Peter and Christ, are leading to a climax where they will be asked to self-identify. Each will be confronted ultimately with the question, who are you? And when this question comes, once again, Christ will be the example of true discipleship while Peter fails the test. But before we get to the question itself, we need to set the stage for each of these men. We see Peter following Jesus and the arresting force at a distance. This phrase is crucial to the truth of this passage, and to be quite frank with you, it's kind of haunted me this week. Following at a distance. Peter followed, but at a distance. Doesn't that kind of sound like us? We're close enough to see what's going on, but far away enough for plausible deniability. We're close enough to see where they're taking Jesus, but far enough away to not be identified with him. And I would suggest that this is a picture of false discipleship that's trying to skip the first two requirements of discipleship. Do you remember the three? How did Jesus lay it out? If you would come after me, what? Deny self, take up cross, and follow me. And here it's as though we have Peter, he's, he's doing the third one, following but skipping the self-denial and the cross. 
Because Jesus is headed directly toward the cross. And Peter's trying to follow without paying the price. He follows, but without denying self. He follows, but without submission to the cross. And I would suggest that that's often what we're tempted to do. Quite frankly, we we are tempted to avoid paying the price or follow as it's convenient. We're willing to maintain some of the trappings of belief, but when hardship comes or the cost seems high or we simply want to do our own thing, we step back at a distance and we choose not to identify ourselves with Christ. One practical way, perhaps, that this happens, it's not the only way, but one way that came to my mind this week is is the question of baptism. You know, there are a number of people who claim to belong to Christ, who say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, They may even go to church. But when it comes to taking the step of public open identification with the death of Jesus Christ, with who he is and what he has done. The person says, ah, I don't really need that. You know, I look at baptism, you know, what's it for? I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. I don't need that. I would suggest the scripture would argue against that. But that's one way, if you're looking for a concrete way, perhaps, it's not the only way, of course, but it's one way that we follow at a distance, perhaps, where we're willing to go to a certain point, but we don't want to take, we don't want to be fully identified with Jesus. Why does this happen? Why does it happen in the case of Peter and the other disciples? I think from the context, it's pretty clear that it was fear that was driving this denial of Christ or this refusal to identify with him. And to be honest, and I think we have to have some grace for the disciples here, uh, I think all of us would have been frightened in this context because the threat was very clear. To begin with, it's a threat of arrest, but as the account progresses, very quickly we see that it's not just a question of arrest and that the chief priests and the leaders aren't just looking to imprison Christ, but they're looking for his death. And suddenly the cost of self-identifying with Christ has grown astronomically. And they were not willing to do that. I have a friend named Brian um, who, I have several friends named Brian, uh, (laughs) but uh, a friend named Brian who's an ethics professor in Germany right now, but he used to live in the United States when I lived there. And Brian loved, um, he's kind of a daredevil. And he loved fast things. And he had a Kawasaki 750 uh, road racing motorcycle. And one of his great joys in life was to entice innocent bystanders to take, bystanders to take a ride on his motorcycle with him. And once he got them on the seat, his goal in life was to terrify them. And he was good at it. <laughs> he really was. He took great pleasure in just terrifying anyone who would agree to ride on the backseat of his motorcycle. I never did because I saw what he did the first time to someone else. And I was like, there's no way, I made a vow to myself, there is no way I will ever ride a motorcycle with Brian Brock. And to this day, I have kept that vow. I have never ridden it. And it was terrifying. I was like, you know, I'll watch you. I'll watch you terrify other people, but that's not going to be me. Now, I'd suggest that in the case of Brian and his motorcycle, I was driven by fear, but it was fear that led me into a wise choice. But I, I think perhaps we view that surrender to Christ and identification with him with the same kind of fear and terror as getting on the back of that motorcycle because what, what drives that fear? It's that loss of control. And that was what was so af- fearful for those who rode on the back of Brian's motorcycle was they had no control over the situation. Zero. And, you know, pleading and begging, please stop, please stop, only made him go faster. So we picture that kind of surrender to Christ and the the, the idea of losing our self-determination, losing control over our own future, over our own lives, even though it's kind of a mythical control, even though the, the idea of losing it is just absolutely terrifying. And so we refuse to identify with him. 
<laughs> but the truth is that identification with Christ and his death and his resurrection, in that identification, we receive all the power and the promises and the love and the faithfulness of the Godhead on our behalf. And just to close out this setting the stage with Peter, I want to remind us that identifying with Jesus is not about comparison to other people. It's not about just being a little bit more committed than the person sitting next to me on one side or the other. I think this could have been a temptation for perhaps for Peter. Mark makes it very clear that Peter went farther than anybody else. Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. So imagine Peter there, you know, warming his hands over the fire, and he looks around and he's like, in good Peter fashion, I'm the only one here. That chicken James, where is he now? You know? Where's John? All those guys, I'm the only one here. I can see pride creeping in there to Peter. I'm the only one who was brave enough to come right into the lion's den. You know, I'm inside the precincts of the chief priest. I'm right here, and I'm the only one. And we know that ultimately the fact that he was a little bit geographically closer to the event meant nothing because of where his heart was and because of his ultimate response. So it's, it's not about comparison. It's not about saying, well, I'm okay because I self-identify with Christ more than this person or that person. This is a question that is between you and me and the Almighty because he knows our hearts and he also knows our fears. So we leave Peter here in the courtyard for a moment, still warming his hands by the fire, while we climb the stairs to the upper room here in the high priest's home to see what is going on with Jesus. Jesus is in the midst of a kangaroo court. Uh, That might be a new expression for some of you, Um, but it's essentially a court that is a joke, uh, an unfair, biased joke of a trial. First of all, there was a Jewish law that prohibited nighttime trials. Where are we right now? We're in the middle of the night, late at night. See, there's a time pressure on these religious leaders because this account begins with Gethsemane and the Passover on Thursday evening. So the Sabbath is coming, right? Sundown on Friday, the Sabbath begins. They still need to convict Jesus themselves. Plus, the Jewish authorities did not have the right to inflict capital punishment. So in order to execute Jesus, they would have to get the avowal of the Roman authority, so they'd have to take him to Pilate, which we know happened. And all this needed to happen, including the execution itself, before sundown on Friday. So they're in a rush, so they're willing to cut corners. So we have a nighttime trial here going on, first of all. Secondly, what kind of trial is it? My understanding of a trial is that it's supposed to determine whether an individual is innocent or guilty. That's not what's going on in this particular trial. It is one-sided and intentionally one-sided. What are the religious leaders looking for? They are looking for witnesses who will condemn Jesus so that they can ask for the death penalty. They want to put him to death. That's very clear, and that's what they're about. They're not even pretending to seek fairness or justice. They've decided they want to put Jesus away, so they'll seek until they find testimony that will convict him. And what does Jesus do? He's just quiet. He doesn't even need to answer because the witnesses can't agree. A little side note that I want to draw out here. I don't think this is a major emphasis of this passage, but I think it's worth applying it to us briefly. Don't expect the world to treat Christians fairly. Just don't, okay? I'm not saying that you will never be treated fairly. I'm not implying that. I'm not saying that a court would never treat a Christian fairly. I'm just saying don't be shocked or surprised when the world doesn't or when the world intentionally is biased against followers of Jesus. Because scriptures promise that if we identify with Christ, we will suffer, we will be persecuted, and we may face all that Christ faced. So don't expect government and society to be fair. Now, This brings both Jesus and Peter to the verge of this crucial question. How will you identify yourself? Who are you? Now, Mark deals with Jesus first. 
The Sanhedrin's been going back and forth with witness after witness, trying desperately to find some evidence that will justify the death penalty because they needed at least two witnesses. So they're willing to cut corners in some parts of Jewish law, but apparently not all, because they need two witnesses at least, because a person, according to Jewish law, could not be put to death on the witness of just one person, had to be at least two. And this is where, you know, they can't even cheat well, uh, because how hard would it have been? They're already unfair, they're already biased, to get two people and say, look, here's the deal. You guys say the same thing. This is what you're going to say. Here's your script. Here's your script. Memorize it. We'll come in. They, they're getting desperate. No, they can't get any of their witnesses to agree. And then one of their last steps is to try to accuse Jesus of terrorism. He's going to uh, destroy this temple. Literally. He said it. And he's going to rebuild it again in three days. But even then, they can't agree. So finally, I think in utter frustration... The high priest looks at Jesus and says, So, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? That's as clear as it can be, folks. And here we have a religious and secular authority looking at Jesus and directly and publicly asking him, Are you the Messiah? And Jesus has kept this truth under wraps during his earthly ministry so far to this point. He shared it with his disciples and those close to him, but it hasn't gone beyond that. In fact, he intentionally told the disciples not to tell others that truth. But now for the first time, he answers clearly and resoundingly to the, to the religious authority of the day and publicly. And he assumes his identity. He doesn't avoid it. He doesn't dodge it. And actually, up until now, he's just been silent. So if he had just remained quiet, he could have avoided the cross, theoretically anyway. But instead, he says, I am. I am. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of the Blessed One. But Jesus goes further than that. And this is beautiful because I imagine Christ being incredibly frustrated that these false witnesses can't get their act together. Because Jesus has already submitted to the will of the Father. That happened in Gethsemane and before. Remember, not my will, but yours be done. So Christ's course to the cross has been set. He's going. And I just, yes, this is my imagination. I'm not saying it happened this way, but I can imagine Christ just standing there, just rolling his eyes. I need to go, I need to get to the cross. Okay, you guys aren't going to do it. Okay, I'm going to do it. Yes, I'm the Messiah, but you know what? I'm more than that. And you're going to see the Son of Man, that's me, at the right hand of God coming on the clouds in glory. So Jesus says, I am Messiah, that's true, but I'm more than that because I'm also divine. And he's making a claim to his divinity. And Jesus, this is important for us to see, in taking up his full identity, He is moving actively toward the cross. It's not just passively. He's not just going with the flow. He is saying, I am going to do this. I am going to the cross. Now, that was all the high priest needed because all the other witnesses were moot at that point. Jesus stood condemned of blasphemy out of his own mouth because how could a man claim to be God? So with great joy and relief, the high priest feigns and fakes his shock, and he rips his clothes and he calls for a conviction. But Christ takes up his true identity, even though this identification with the Father, with God, is going to lead to his death. He's true to his Father. He's true to his discipleship. He is true to his mission. He could have remained silent as he had all night, but he chose actively to go to the cross. Meanwhile, down below in the courtyard, It's Peter. The way Mark writes it, just as Christ is sealing his own death warrant, Peter is being questioned about his own identity. Hey, you were you were with that man, weren't you? No, no, I wasn't. Who? What? What man? Him? No, I just I just saw a fire. I'm hot. I'm you know I was cold. I'm just warm. I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, you are one of them. You're one of those guys who followed him around everywhere. No, I'm not. Dude, you have that hick Galilean accent. You have to be one of them. You hear anybody else around here talking like that? Of course you're with them. No, I'm not. 
And then Peter calls down curses on himself and on them. He is so aggressive in denying his identity because essentially these questions are saying to him, who are you? Will you identify yourself with this man? And three times, each time with increasing strength, Peter says, no, I am not. And then we know the story, the rooster crows. And at that moment, Peter remembers the prophecy of Christ. He remembers that it has come true. He's failed the test again. He has denied his true identity. Instead of denying self, as a disciple is called to do, he's denied Christ. And he breaks down weeping. I want you to hold that image of Peter in your minds. Abject sorrow and shame. Weakness. Fear. Because this man is going to be almost unidentifiable as a man who stands up in Acts chapter 2 in front of the multitude and at a risk of his life preaches the truth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Something happens between this moment in Peter's life and that moment. Now, I know that most of you know what that is, but we'll be looking at that specifically on Easter Sunday. But I want you to hold this image of Peter in your mind because there's a transformation that's going to take place. And so Jesus is now completely alone. It's been prophesied that he would be abandoned by all, and now he has been abandoned by all. Everyone has fallen away. Everyone has deserted him. But friends, this had to happen. Jesus had to go to the cross alone. Because there's no human help that could have been given to him at that point. What did Peter have to offer Christ that would help Christ on the cross? What do any of us have to offer? The whole point is that the only one who had anything to offer was God himself. And I want to remind you of this theme of scripture that our God is a God who provides his own sacrifice. Going all the way back to Abraham. Going all the way back to the Garden of Eden where God provides his own sacrifice and Jesus is that sacrifice and he's on his way to the cross and it has to be done alone because there's no human that has anything to offer that's going to bring redemption or that's going to bring hope. Only the death of God could have any power to free souls tied up and addicted to sin and perversion. And Jesus stepped forward into his true identity, son of God, saving Messiah, and made sure that he would be condemned because that was the plan of God. But Peter, Peter is human, and Peter is weak, and Peter is fallen and sinful and fearful. In short, Peter is a lot like us. And I want to suggest here that following Christ from a distance will inevitably lead to denying him. Have you ever tried in a car to follow another car in Sao Paulo from a distance. <laughs> Inevitably, you will be separated. Inevitably, you will get lost. Unless you know where you're going and you have ways. Following Christ from a distance will inevitably lead to separation from him and to denial of him. <clears throat> and I want to go back to this idea of fear this visceral fear that keeps us at a distance. We're so governed by fear, fear that self will be put to death and that we will not survive that. Fear that we will not have fun. I think that's a very powerful fear, particularly in the younger generation. Fear that following Christ means kissing fun goodbye because fun in many ways has become an idol. Fear that God's will is not good. Fear that he's going to fail us at some point. Fear that he's not good. Fear of suffering. Fear of poverty. Fear of boredom. Fear of mockery. But underlying all these fears, I think there's a more foundational one, and it's this. We're afraid that Jesus 
will not be enough. So relationship with God will not be enough to compensate for what we leave behind. That Jesus will not be enough to fulfill me, to love me, to protect my soul. That Jesus will not be enough to see me and carry me, carry me through persecution if that comes. That he will not be enough to, to, to love me. That his love won't be enough if I never get married. That, that his hope will not be enough to make this life worth it. And that he won't be enough if I give up the pleasure of sin and self-determination, the holy pleasures of Christ won't, they won't be enough. But Christ can be trusted. It's worth denying self, it's worth taking up the cross, and it's worth following. And if you find yourself today in that paralysis of fear, I, I, I want to suggest something that sounds very, very uh, perhaps over simple, but here it is. Take the next step. And that step is going to be different for all of us in here. The steps that we're talking about are almost always steps of obedience. And obedience is broad. It can be a question of obeying in changing our thoughts, that we have perceived God in a certain way that is not in accordance with Scripture, and so we must change the way we think about God. It might be an action. It may be something we need to give up. When I was recently in the U.S. with my family, um, Julie and I got to take our boys, Ethan and Micah, to a climbing gym or the, these tall climbing walls, um, and I think they're about probably about a couple meters taller than the ceiling here, so they're tall. But when you stand on the ground and look up at them, they're not overwhelming. And uh, you see, you watch other people, you know, scaling these walls with great ease and agility, and all of them are hooked into a belaying rope, and from time to time you'll see someone slip and the rope catches them immediately and the person that's belaying them on the ground holds them there or else lowers them slowly. And, you know, Micah, uh, he just, you know, up and down, up and down, no problem. Ethan um, would get halfway up and he would freeze over and over and over again. And he would get so frustrated with himself. And he, he'd stand beside me on the ground and look up and he'd say, you know what, that's not that, it's not that high. But when I get there, I, I just, I just freeze I'm so afraid to go higher. He said, in my mind, I know that it's safe. In my mind, I know that even if I fall, the rope's going to catch me, but I'm just too scared. And for Ethan, the task became when he got to that point, and it was exactly halfway when he got to that point, to take one more step. So it wasn't a matter of going all the way to the top in one leap. It was just one more step and one more step and one more step and then one more step and eventually one time Ethan made it to the top and he was so excited and he was so happy but it was done by just the next step the next step don't don't worry about getting all the way to the top what's the next step what is God calling you today the next step in conquering that fear last week Ethan called me and he said, Dad, Dad, listen, listen, I made it to the top a bunch of times now. I'm going all the way up, but you know why? Like the first time, uh, yesterday I was climbing, he was really excited. I was climbing and he said, I slipped for the first time and I fell. And the rope caught me. And he said, ever since then, I haven't been afraid. It's like it's not a challenge anymore. And the experience of the faithfulness of Christ is what ultimately is going to combat that fear. Because right now, for many of us, it may just be theoretical. We've never placed ourselves in that situation of truly trusting him, fully identifying with him and saying, I'm all in, I'm yours. I trust you. But today, the question is this, what's the next step? And if you're in fear this morning, 
There's another great benefit that God offers to you. You know, we're, we're celebrating the table of the Lord, communion this morning, as we have been throughout Lent. And it's at his table that we see reenacted for us his sacrifice on our behalf. And here's a little spoiler alert. You know what transforms Peter as an encounter with the risen Christ? An encounter with the risen Christ who's already gone through the cross and the grave and has come out victorious on the other side. And as believers, we need to constantly receive from Christ. That's why the way Christ puts it is being attached to him remaining in him, in the vine, so that we're constantly being fed by him. And this is one of those ways that he feeds us because we come to him and we receive. And physically, we receive the bread and the juice and our physical bodies are nourished. And as we do that, we are nourished spiritually and that's a spiritual nourishment that we receive by faith. By faith that Jesus is who he says he is. That this meal commemorates and remembers his death and his sacrifice for us. So as those who will be serving this morning come forward to prepare the table, I offer you a few moments to meditate on this. To consider how fear may have paralyzed you from identifying with Christ, from entering into his identity fully an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to examine you and show you what that next step for you is. Some of you may already know what that next step is. Others of you may not. But this is an opportunity to listen and discern.